to the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, there were 216 million clinical episodes of malaria in 2016, and 445,000 people died, most of whom were young children in sub-Saharan Africa. In this short lecture, I'll review two key plants that were used in traditional medicine and were later developed into pharmaceutical drugs to combat malaria. Malaria is a global scourge that occurs across the tropical and subtropical areas of the world. Humans have been battling this disease for millennia, and in many systems of medicine, they've turned to plants as a means of treating the disease and its symptoms. Nearly half the world's population lives in areas at risk of malaria transmission across 91 countries and territories. The most vulnerable are young children who haven't yet developed partial immunity to malaria. Pregnant women are also vulnerable because their immunity is impacted during pregnancy. And so are travelers or migrants who've not been previously exposed. But first, though, let's review the life cycle of the malaria parasite to better understand the challenges that it presents. Malaria persists through a cyclical infection of humans and female Anopheles mosquitoes. Once in humans, the malaria parasites grow and multiply in the liver cells and then in the blood red blood cells. Once in the blood, parasites continue to grow in red blood cells, destroying the cells in the process and releasing merozoites, or daughter parasites, into the blood to infect other red blood cells. The blood stage is what causes the symptoms of malaria, and this includes fever, chills, sweats, headaches, body aches, malaise, nausea, and vomiting. More severe cases of malaria can cause neurological problems, severe anemia, acute respiratory distress syndrome, acute kidney injury, among other problems, and can also lead to death. When the blood stage parasites are eaten by a female Anopheles mosquito, they can then mate in the mosquito's gut and begin a new cycle of growth and multiplication in the mosquito. So when that mosquito feeds on another human, the parasites can be spread to another and the cycle continues. Parasite doesn't cause disease in the mosquito, just the human is infected and exhibits disease symptoms. Now let's go over some historic plants that have been very important in the fight against malaria. Cinchona species belong to the Rubiaceae family and are native to South America. The Cinchona bark, also known as Peruvian bark or Jesuit's bark or fever bark, is renowned for its medicinal properties. In traditional medicine, it has been used as a fever remedy, an astringent, and spasmolytic. Cinchona is believed to derive its name from the Countess of Cincon, the wife of a Spanish viceroy of Peru. After contracting an attack of fever while visiting Peru in the 1600s, the story goes that the Countess was cured by the Cinchona bark. The bark was then administered topically in powdered form in wine and spirits and active ingredients were later determined to be the quinoline alkaloids, which includes quinine, quinidine, synchonine, synchonidine, and quinamine. The discovery of synchona bark as an anti-malarial permitted explorations and colonization of interior Africa and India by Europeans. Control of synchona trade also influenced World War II. When Allied troops lost access to quinine supplies, tens of thousands of troops in Africa and the Pacific were lost to malaria. Here are two books that I can recommend on the history of cinchona bark in medicine. The Fever Trail by Mark Honigsbong provides a fascinating account of the path to discovery and the importance of cinchona bark for malaria. Just the Tonic by Kim Walker and Mark Nesbitt traces the path of how the bitter and bioactive compound quinine became a part of tonic water. You can also learn more about this story by listening to the episode of my podcast, Foodie Pharmacology, in which I discuss this topic with Mark and Kim. In 1820, a pair of French scientists isolated the alkaloids, synchonine and quinine from the powdered cinchona bark. And this allowed for the creation of standardized doses of the active ingredients. Interestingly, despite being in use for centuries now, the precise mechanism of action for quinine against malaria remains unresolved, though it is thought to inhibit hemozoan crystallization. 
Hemozoin is a metabolically crystallized byproduct of the digestion of hemoglobin by the parasite during infection of the red blood cells, and it is critical to the biology of the malarial disease. Other uses of quinine have included applications for the treatment of nighttime leg cramps, but due to the risk of cardiotoxicity, especially in elderly patients, the U.S. FDA no longer permits the sale of quinine for this purpose. In 2006, the World Health Organization no longer recommended quinine as a first-line malarial treatment due to other less risky options becoming available. Some of the toxicities of quinine, which fall under the disease syndrome of synchronism, include symptoms of headaches, rain in the ears, skin rashes, blurred vision or blindness, anaphylactic shock, disturbed heart rhythm, and cardiotoxicity. The next plant we'll discuss on the topic of antimalarial therapies is that of the sweet wormwood, or Artemisia annua, in the Asteraceae family. Artemisinin is a sesquiterpene lactone that was discovered in 1972 by Dr. Tu Yu Yu, and she won the 2015 Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology for this discovery. In the late 1960s, a national project was launched in China to fight the emergence of chloroquine-resistant malaria. The project was launched in response to a request during the Vietnam War from the North Vietnamese leaders that were suffering heavy losses due to malaria. Chairman Mao and Premier Zhao called for an urgent effort to find solutions. During the first stage of the work led by Dr. Tu and other investigators, they found more than 2,000 Chinese herb preparations, studied those, and identified 640 hits that had possible antimalarial activities. Of those, around 200 Chinese herbs were then tested in mouse models of malaria. Their team hit a major turning point when they found that Artemisia annua showed strong inhibition of the parasite growth, but the results weren't always reproducible. Artemisia annua had a long history of use in traditional Chinese medicine, and so they turned to the literature to understand how it was used. And the literature they investigated went way back in time, including more recent 500-year-old copies of a handbook of prescriptions for emergencies by Gi Hong, from 284 to 346 CE. Upon reading that the therapy was prepared as an infusion of the plant in water, which was wrung out and drunk, Dr. Tu explained, this sentence gave me the idea that the heating involved in the conventional extraction step we had used might have destroyed the active components, and that extraction at a lower temperature might be necessary to preserve antimalarial activity. Indeed, we obtained much better activity after switching to a lower temperature procedure. And it was because of her attention to different sources of evidence and follow-up experiments that she was able to obtain a non-toxic extract of the plant that was 100% effective against the malarial parasite in both mice and monkey experiments. And this was the breakthrough discovery of artemisinin. Later, clinical trials and further work to develop capsules of artemisinin kick-started the path to broader use as a drug. A number of derivatives have also been developed off of this initial discovery of artemisinin, and in 2005, the World Health Organization announced a switch in their antimalarial strategy to artemisinin combination therapy, or ACT, which combines some of these artemisinin derivatives with other types of antimalarials. The rationale behind ACT is that the chance of the malaria parasite developing resistance to more than one drug at a time is lower than if treated with a single compound. Interestingly, although there are a number of potential cellular targets for the mechanism of action of artemisinin derivatives, these remain to be verified experimentally. Regardless, artemisinin combination therapy is widely used and has saved many lives, it also reduces many of the symptoms of malaria because of its activity on malaria gametocytes. The artemisinins are among some of the most potent antimalarial agents, and this is because they are effective against nearly all asexual and sexual parasite stages and can kill malaria parasites within minutes, resulting in rapid clinical responses. The cinchona alkaloids we discussed earlier, such as quinine and quinidine, and the artemisinins are the two classes of compounds used today to manage severe malaria. Malaria has been a scourge on humankind for millennia. 
it's fascinating that of the two most effective groups of compounds against severe malaria, the cinchona alkaloids and the artemisinin sesquiterpene lactones, both came from medicinal plants with a long basis in the traditional medicine paradigms of their native region. Also interesting is that despite being used to treat millions of people and saving countless lives, modern science has yet to fully uncover the precise mechanism by which they elicit this potent antimalarial effect. I don't know about you, but these stories both make me curious about what other bits of ancient wisdom concerning the use of plants as medicine are out there just waiting to be rediscovered for evaluation by modern science. There are a lot of resources available now online. So as we wrap up, I challenge you to take a look for yourself and browse the centuries old texts that have been digitized and posted to websites like the Biodiversity Heritage Library and others. 